The Navison record now stands as part of this country's cultural experience. And yet, in spite of the fact that hundreds of thousands of people have seen it, the film continues to remain an enigma. Some insist it must be true. Others believe it is a trick on a par with the Orson Welles radio romp, The War of the Worlds. Many more have never even heard of it. It's funny. I just want to create a record of how Karen and I bought a small house in the country and moved into it with our children. Sort of see how everything turns out. No gunfire, famine, or flies. Just a lot of toothpaste, gardening, and people stuff. I just thought it'd be nice to see how people move into a place and start to inhabit it. A place to drink lemonade on the porch and watch the sunset. Will Nabitson, an internationally celebrated photojournalist, began his project by mounting a number of high aid video cameras around the house, equipping them with motion detectors to turn them on or off whenever someone enters or leaves the room. With the exception of the bathrooms, there are cameras in every corner of the house. Navison also keeps on hand two Ariflex movie cameras, as well as his normal battery of 35 millimeter still cameras. Navison also gave his wife, Karen Green, a 37-year-old former fashion model, a high eight to keep a video diary. The couple have two young children, Chad and Daisy. After living in the house for some months, a domestic repair leads Navis into the chance discovery that the house measures a quarter of an inch wider inside than it does outside. Over the weeks, the anomaly grows to three quarters of an inch. Navison is certain he is not mistaken, and to aid his investigations into this phenomenon, he calls upon the help of his estranged brother, Tom, a builder. Tom should be here any time. Navy is successful. Tom is not. There's been a lot of resentment over the years. I guess it's always been there, except when they lived at home. They kind of looked after each other more. Funny, all it took was a fraction of an inch to get us in a car together. Pretty strange. Yeah, thanks for coming, Tom. Like there was really a chance I'd say no? I almost wonder if I got tangled up in all this measuring stuff just so I'd have some pretext to call you. <laughs> well, there are simpler reasons you could have come up with. Yeah. You're telling me. Mavison also invited Billy Reston, an old friend, to participate in the explorations. A tenured professor of structural engineering, who has access to the most precise surveying instruments, Reston is also a paraplegic, who has spent almost half his life in an aluminum wheelchair. Navison was barely 27 when he first met Reston. It was a photograph that brought them together. Navison had been on assignment in India, taking pictures of trains. What ended up on the pages of more than a few newspapers, however, was a photograph of a black American engineer trying to outrun a falling high-voltage wire. That was the last time I had legs. Right before that ugly snake bit him off. <laughs> I used to hate that picture. But then I sort of became grateful for it. Now... Whenever anyone walks into my office, they don't have to think about asking me how I ended up in this chariot. They can see for themselves. Thank you, Navy. Ricky Tiki Tavy with a Nikon. After an investigation that confirms Navison's measurements, the anomaly disappears. Then one evening in the middle of July, when the couple are in their bedroom, seemed to undo several months of legal process when it acted to overturn one of Oliver North's three convictions in the Iran Navy, country. downstairs! It's downstairs! Guilty verdicts to a state of suspension. In the living room, Navison discovers the echoes emanating from a dark, doorless hallway, which has appeared in the west wall. He plunges in. Karen cannot follow. Navison soon reappears with both children who have candles, their faces like sprites on a winter's eve. That night, Karen keeps a tight grip on Navison. Even when they slip into bed, she's still holding his hand. Navy, promise me you won't go in there again. Let's 
See if it's even here in the morning. It huh? will be. Oh, I love you so much. Please promise me. Please. I promise. Tom Davison, summoned back to the house on Ash Tree Lane, installs a door to close off the opening. Behind the door, the space in the hallway keeps growing or extending. Intermittently, Will Navison opens the door himself and stares down the hallway, sometimes using a flashlight, sometimes just studying the darkness itself. What do you do with that, Tom? Move. The space between Navison and Karen keeps growing, too. Their own feelings are seemingly impossible for them to address as the meaning of the hallway itself. Both confide to their personal video diaries. Sex, sex, sex. It was like we just met when we got here. The kids would go out and we in the kitchen, in the shower. We even did it in the garage. But ever since that closet thing appeared, I can't. I don't know why. It terrifies me. When we first moved here, Karen was like a college co-ed. Anywhere, anytime. Now, all of a sudden, she refuses to be touched. I kiss her, she practically starts to cry. Doesn't he see? I don't want him going in there because I love him. You don't have to be a genius to realize there's something really bad about that place. Navy, don't you see that? The only thing I want to do is go in there. But she's adamant that I don't, and I love her, so I won't. But this is killing me. Maybe because I know this is all about her, her fears, her anxieties. She doesn't give a thought to what I care about. But I will say this. If he goes in there, I'm out of here. Kids and all. If she keeps up this cold front, you bet I'm going in there. In early August, Nabison reveals the doorway and the space beyond to visiting friends at a dinner party. Karen is so enraged that she makes him sleep on the sofa in the living room with his beloved hallway. Navison doesn't sleep. A title card at this point in the Navison record reads, Exploration A. Test one, two. <laughs> Call me impetuous or just curious. But a little look around isn't going to hurt. Cold. Wow. Really cold. I have a high 8 a mag light, and my 35 mil Nikon. Walls are dark. Black. Slightly gray, perhaps. Similar to the closet space upstairs. It's about 70 feet long. That's it. And nothing else. No big deal. <laughs> Over this, Karen and I have been fighting. <laughs> Another door. He wasn't here before. This one's easily, I'd say, a hundred feet. Another one, larger. Can't see how long. I'm passing doorways on both sides. Uh, here's no lock. A room, not very big. No windows, no switches, no outlets. Heading back to the corridor. Going on. <sighs> Seems colder now. And maybe I'm just getting colder. Going along the corridor. Torch isn't showing any end. Yeah, this is big. Wow, big arch here. Huge space. I better be able to find my way back. I can't see the arch. Which way? Oh, God. 
Sleep. Daisy had a bad dream. I'm sorry, Navy. I'm sorry I got so mad. It's not your fault. That thing just scares me. Come back to bed. We'll turn the investigation over to Billy Reston. Then we'll call the New York Times, Larry King, whoever, and we'll move. End of story. Navison admits in his video diary that he feels lousy lying to Karen, but he does not tell her about his exploration. He does not, however, return to the hallway, but does tell Billy Reston about his promise to Karen and presumably about his experience. Reston moves back to the house and puts in a call to Holloway Roberts, a professional hunter and explorer. In the sequence, the Reston interview, the engineer says, I always thought it was rock solid, just look at his CV. Never for a moment did I suspect he was capable of that. Holloway was more than willing to participate. Navison shows him a map he's made from his exploration and opens the door in the living room. How far back does it go? You're about to find out. Just be careful of the shifts. Holloway Roberts arrives with two assistants. The tracker, Jed Leader, a shy man who loves the wilderness and listening to Lyle Lovett with his fiancée. He's from Texas. I think that's where we're going to get married. And Wax Hook, at 26, the youngest of the trio. This has to be the weirdest. When Holloway asked me if I wanted to explore a house, I thought he was cracked. But whatever Holloway does is interesting to me, so, sure. I went for it, and sure enough, this is the weirdest. Holloway also arrives carrying a rifle, a Weatherby 300 Magnum. Holloway is probably unnerved by Navison's distinguished career. Navison is privately incensed that he must ask another man to explore his own house. In earlier years, Navison would have paid little attention to Karen and headed down those corridors by himself. Yet the move to Virginia was about repairing their crumbling relationship. Karen would refrain from relying on other men to mollify her insecurities if Navison curbed his own risk lust. The appearance of the hallway, however, tests those informal vows. Later that evening, Holloway places his hand on Karen's back. Neighborson bumps Holloway aside with his shoulder, revealing his easily underestimated strength. For exploration number one, the team enter the hallway equipped with hi parkers, gloves, powerful lamps and batteries, and a radio and fishing line. There's almost two miles of line here. Don't let go of it. We won't. Okay? Okay. Let's go. What have we got? We got a ceiling here, Wax? I'm getting something at the end of the beam. At least 200 feet high. There's an opposing wall. See that? Got it, Jeff. I'm 1,500 feet away. At least. Featureless otherwise. Hold up. We're out of line here. Two miles. Is that another entrance? God. It's huge. What's through there? We could go on. Leave the line. Put down markers. Jed, do you? Holloway? We go back. 
Is it me or are the walls closer now? Jed? Not 1,500 feet. Oh, pretty much as Navidson warned us. Just as long as the shifts don't sever the line. Exploration one took an hour. The next day, the team set out on what the Navison record titles Exploration two, which lasts eight hours. This time, the team only hear the growl once, and the resulting shifts of the walls are negligible. They cover eight miles before returning. The greatest discovery is announced to those waiting over the radio. We found a spiral staircase just beyond what we're in the great hall in the ante room. The staircase is, I'd say, 200 feet across and spirals down into, I don't know, nothing. When Holloway plays back the high eight, Navison's frustrations get the best of him. He leaves the room. After the team return, they try and describe the staircase further. Jed says, It was enormous. We dropped a few flares down it, but never heard them hit bottom. I mean, in that place, it being so empty and cold and still and all, you really can hear a pin drop. But the darkness just swallowed the flares right up. So deep, man. It's like it's almost dreamlike. Tom later tries to convince Karen to let Navison lead the next exploration. Tom, nothing's stopping Navy. If he wants to go, he can go, but then I go too. That's our deal. Exploration 3 is a disappointment. Exploration 4 will be far longer. Better equipped. More serious. How can I know where to go when I don't know where we are? I mean, where is that place in relation to here, to us, to everything? Where? Holloway decides to take along his rifle. What the hell do you plan to shoot? Just in case. Navison has settled on the belief that the growl is just a sound created when the house alters its internal layout. With all due respect. Holloway is not in accordance with this. Since I'm the one actually going in there. That night, Holloway, Jed, and Wax camp out in the living room. Somehow, Wax ends up with Karen in the kitchen. She picks at a bowl of popcorn. He helps himself to another beer. On the counter, someone has left a copy of the map Navison drew following the earlier exploration of the hallway he had concealed from Karen. Did you draw that? Mm. Nah, can't draw. Oh. I actually don't know who made it. I thought maybe your uh, old man, Navy, did it. Then, out of nowhere, Wax leans over and kisses Karen on the lips. It lasts less than a second and clearly shocks her. But when he leans over and kisses her again, she does not resist. Wax starts to follow her but realizes the game is already over. It is a little strange Karen did not erase the tape in the wall-mounted camcorder. When Navison saw the kiss on tape... I'm surprised, I guess. But there's no rage, just regret. I betrayed her when I went in there the first time, and so she betrayed me. People always say how two people were meant for each other. Well, we weren't, but somehow we ended up together anyway and had two incredible children. It's too bad I love her. I wish it didn't have to turn out like this. Billy Reston concentrates on the radios, monitoring Holloway, Jad, and Wax as they make their way through the Great Hall. Exploration 4 is underway. Are you receiving me? We're well, you fine, Billy. I'll try and improve reception. Again, please. Billy, we're continuing down the spiral staircase. We'll try again in 15 minutes. Over and out. By that evening... Radio contact is lost. This is the last anyone hears of Holloway and his companions. Eight days pass. Reston and Tom man the radios. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. You want another game of go? No. Not really, Tom. I hear them. Billy? Tom? Bro, don't ask me how, but it's coming from in there. In fact, for a second, it sounded like it was right on the other side of the wall. 
They've been in there eight days with water for six. Why don't we just call the police? Why does it always have to be the great Will Navidson who goes to the rescue? We don't have time to get officials involved or a search party organized. We have to go now. Navidson calls this sequence SOS. It takes only 30 minutes to assemble the necessary supplies. The plan is for Reston to go as far as the staircase, where he will establish a camp and handle the radios, serving as a relay between Karen in the living room and Navidson and Tom, who will continue down the stairs. As the party of three, Navis and Tom and Reston, enter the black hallway, we see briefly Karen on the phone to her mother. Yes, they're going in. He's going in. At this point, the Navis and record cuts to Holloway, Roberts, Jed and Wax as they reach the bottom of the spiral staircase after three days. Following a night's rest... So where now? Holloway takes responsibility for marking their path. He tacks neon arrows to the wall and meets out plenty of fishing line. Okay. Why not? You know where you're going, Holloway? I know. On. And on. That's all. There's nothing here, Holloway. We need to head back. We're getting low on rations. Yeah. When Holloway's team finally begins the long trek back, they discover the staircase is much further away than they had anticipated. They are forced to camp for a fourth night, thus necessitating strict rationing of food, water, and batteries. On the morning of the fifth day, they reached the staircase, now more than 750 feet wide. On the sixth day, the climb proceeds smoothly until Holloway discovers that one of their neon markers has been badly mauled. Worse, their next cache of supplies has been gutted. Got traces of the plastic water jug here, Jed. Fuel for campfire stove is gone. You scattered bits of the power bars. Oh, huh. yeah, that's nice. Holloway? I think we should explore at least some of the hallways off the stairway at this point. With the gun? <sighs> Jed, take the camera. The growl almost always comes like a rustle of a high mountain wind on the trees. You hear at first in the distance a gentle rumble, slowly growing louder as it descends until finally it's all around you, sweeping over you, and then past you until it's gone, a mile away, two miles away, impossible to follow. We're not getting any closer. Still longer, I promise. No, Holloway. We have to turn back now. Oh, cowards, both of you. We're heading home now. I give the orders here, and I say no one's going anywhere yet. Look, dude, let's just check in so we can resupply and, you know, um, get more guns. I will not abort this mission. Back on the staircase, Jed and Wax wait for Holloway to cool off and return. When several hours pass, they make a brief foray, Holloway! calling his name, doing everything in their power to locate him. Holloway! They do not find a single meal marker or shred of fishing line. Holloway has run off blind. Holloway! Holloway! I guess... I guess our only option is... Uh, go back without him. The marker. Another one? Yeah. Gone. Messed up. Like the rest. Like my buttons. 
Vanished. It's kind of scary. Like you stop thinking about something and it vanishes. You forget you have pocket zippers and now they're gone. You don't take anything for granted. Where the hell... Where the hell is... Halloway? Jed and Wax reach another cache, placed at the far end of a stair, near some unexplored corridor. Nothing remains of the food, but the water is intact. Someone. What the hell are you talking about? It was an accident. It doesn't matter. I'll go to jail. I'll lose everything. I have to think. Are you kidding me? He'll die if you don't help me carry him. I can't go to prison. I just can't. Don't be ridiculous. You're not going to go to jail. But if you sit there and let Wax die, for that to lock you up for life. And I'll make sure they throw away the key. Now get up and help me. Come on, Wax. Okay. Okay, okay. Sorry, Wax. I can't. I can't. The camera blips on. Jed has moved Wax to another room. Realizing the camcorder is his only chance to provide an explanation for what happened, Jed speaks directly into it. So much for my sense of direction. I spent the last hour looking for a way back to the staircase. No luck. The radio is useless. If help doesn't come soon, he'll die. I'll die. Jed, man, I'm so thirsty. Holloway. At least he's far off. Jed huddles next to Wax in a very small room. Wax is silent. Jed exhausted. Jed refuses to leave his friend. Shit. The growl seems to be closing in. Karen may lose herself in resentment and fear, but Navison seems joyful, even euphoric, as he sets out with Reston and his brother to rescue Holloway and his team. The plan is for Reston to set up camp at the top of the staircase, while Navison and Tom continue on down below. Hey, I can't go down there. <sighs> it's bullshit. What's that supposed to mean? You just giving up on them? Maybe. Look at the man. I'm sorry, Tom. I didn't mean to snap at you like that. Do you think you can stay here with Billy? Or do you want to head home? You have to make it on your own. I'll stay here. With Billy? What's that supposed to mean? The hell if you think I'm letting you go on alone. Wait! Navy? Damn it! 
I should sue the bastards who designed this house. Haven't they heard of handicap ramps? Hey! What? It's no more than a hundred foot to the bottom! What about Holloway's 13 miles down? Reston swings out of his chair and starts down the stairs. Twenty minutes later, he reaches the last step. Navison heads back up to retrieve the wheelchair and the rest of their stuff. Tom seems fine camping near the top of the staircase. Navison hopes his presence will enable us to maintain radio contact for a much longer time than Holloway could. Even if we both know, the house will devour the signal eventually. You sick, Billy? No. It's more... <clears throat> nausea. I haven't felt this way since I went fishing for Marlin. It may have something to do with... Everything here is constantly shifting. It took Holloway, Jet, and Wax almost four days to reach the bottom of the staircase. Yet we made it down in five minutes. The thing collapses like an accordion. You realize if it happens again, you're in deep shit. Considering our supplies, I say we'd both be in deep shit. After following the scant remains of the first team all day, they make camp for the night. They hear nothing during the night and push on next day. That night, as they prepare to make camp. <coughs> Leaving most of their equipment, the two set out in pursuit of the sound. Tom? Tom, can you hear us? How's Karen? Hey, she's pretty scared. You can get back. Tom, what is it? I can't hear you. Navy! Navy! Reston stops his wheelchair and stabs his finger at a wall. How we get through it, I don't have a clue. But that crime's coming from the other side. Searching out more hallways, Nabisim discovers for the first and only time a door without a doorknob. <laughs> Preston keeps the chair-mounted Ariflex camera trained on Navison, and as the door breaks loose, the frame gracefully accepts Jed's ashen features as he faces what he has come to believe is his final moment. He will live a lifetime finished between the space of two frames. Navy! Oh, get down! Get. We're in this shit now. I can barely hear you. Jed's been shot. He's bleeding. Sh shot? By who? I can't see a thing. Since when did you bring a gun? You kidding? This place is scary. Get down. Tom, I'm gonna have to try and move wax. We have to get out of here. I I'm losing you, Navy. C can you... Do you read me over? Tom? Tom? There. The dogs. He's alive, Navy. Come here. Jed's still breathing. Nah, it doesn't matter, Rest. He's still dead. But Wax is alive. While Karen stayed home and Will Navison headed for the front line, Tom spent two nights in no man's land, remaining by the radio at the top of the spiral staircase. Tom, we found another neon marker. Most of it's gone, just a shred. We're laying down line and proceeding. Okay, Navy. See any ghosts? Nothing. Are you a little spooked? Lighting up a fat one. If it gets too much for you, go back. We'll be all right. Over. Out. Whatever. Karen, this is Tom. I would hope so. How's Navy? He's fine. Found another marker. Billy? Fine, too. How are you managing? 
Me? I'm cold, I'm scared, and I feel like I'm about to be eaten alive at any moment. Otherwise, I'd say I'm fine. What kind of voices? Daisy doesn't know. Chad said they sounded like a few people, but he couldn't understand what they were saying. Book me a flight to the Bahamas. Are you kidding? Book a flight for the whole family. This is absurd. Hey, I better sign off. Don't want a bunch of dead batteries on my hands. Tell him I love him, Tom. Tom? Already did. Feels like I'm in a goddamn refrigerator, that's what. So what I want to know is, where's all the goddamn food? God knows I could use a drink. We hear something up ahead, Tom. We're going after it. Good luck, bro. I'm scared, Tom. What, what's the matter? The kids all right? No, they're okay. I mean, I think they're okay. Daisy stays in her room. Chad prefers being outside. Who can argue with that? It's something else. What? All my feng shui stuff. This whole thing doesn't make any sense. How are Navy and Billy doing? Have they found anything? When are they coming back? They heard someone. I, I, I didn't get it all. From what I can gather, they're fine. No, I'm not. I don't like being here alone, Tom. In fact, I'm fed up with being alone. I don't like being scared all the time. I've had enough. After this, I am leaving. I'm taking the kids and I'm going. We didn't need to go through all this. It could have been avoided. Karen, wait a minute. Just back up a second. What were you saying about your Feng Shui stuff? The objects. I put all these objects around the house, you remember, to improve the energy or some such- Sure. Crystals and bullfrogs, goldfish and dragons- Tom, they're all gone! What do you mean? Tom, they're all gone! Did you ask Daisy and Chad? Maybe they took they're them. They're the ones who told me! How's Karen? Not so good, Navy. She's pretty scared. You should get back here. What's the problem? Noise, Tom. It's impossible to hear you. Navy? Navy? Navy, what's happening? I can barely hear you. Jed's been shot. He's bleeding. Shot? By who? What the hell was that? Tom, I'm gonna have to try to move wax. You have to get out of here. I'm, I'm losing you, Navy. Do you read me over? It's probably gonna take us a good eight hours to make it back to the steps with wax in Jed's body. Tom, I need you to meet me at the bottom. We need help. We can't carry him up ourselves. We're gonna need a doctor. Are you down those goddamn stairs? Mr. Monster? No way. Not gonna happen. Navy, I've been alone in this shit all for almost three days, and now you want me to go down there alone? No way! No can do! There. That's not so bad. Mr. Monster! Yeah! You are here, aren't you, Mr. Monster? <laughs> Karen? Are you all right? I'm coming in. Noon on the third day of the rescue attempt. Reston's gloves are torn, his hands are bleeding. Wax's breathing is shallow. Jed's body weighs heavy on Navison. All of which is made even more unbearable when Navison realizes his brother has not come down to meet them. We'll manage, Navy. I shouldn't be surprised this is what Tom does best. He lets you down. Hey! I got a hoist fixed up here! You ready to pull him up? Son of a gun. Within minutes, they are hoisting wax up to Tom. Jed is next, then Reston. You are one heavy bastard! Going up like the fuck of the bar. Reston lights a flare. Then something strange happens. The rope at Navison's feet begins to vanish. The rope he's holding begins to slip with enough speed to leave a burning gash. He has to let go. Reston does not fall. His ascent only accelerates, marked by the burning green light he holds in his hand. Navison is sinking. 
The staircase is stretching. The pulley was Tom from the banister. Tom managed to grab me before the whole kid and caboodle went down the shaft. It took us a few minutes to get our bearings. We still weren't sure what had happened. For almost an hour, I waited, rested, hoped something would change. It didn't. Eventually, I started going over my stuff, trying to figure out what to do next. And then I heard something, something clatter on the floor behind me. It was the hoist. If it fell as Reston reached the top, then it's been falling for at least 50 minutes. It doesn't take a genius to realize I'm an impossible distance down. I don't know how I'm going to get back. Karen is put in an impossible position, torn between the radio and looking after Chad and Daisy. She stays by the radio. When Tom reappears and tells her Navison is only hours away from getting back, she keeps the children home from school because she has every intention of leaving for New York that day. Karen begins packing when Tom rushes out of the doorway again, carrying wax, tears gushing from his eyes. What are you doing? Billy! Well, what about Navy? Where's Navy? We lost him. He's dead? I, I don't think so, but he's still down there, way down. Well, then go in and get him. Go get your brother. You can't just leave him there. Water. <coughs> I need <coughs> water. Wax Hook was rushed by helicopter to a hospital in Washington. He eventually recovered and returned to a life of outdoor activities. The police were called and Jed's body was taken away. Reston provided them with the high eight footage of Holloway shooting Wax and Jed. To the police, the murder appeared to have taken place in a dark hallway. APBs went out statewide. Over the next four days, the film shows the children hiding in their room, rarely saying a thing. Tom does not emerge from the study, trying to drink his grief into submission. Reston remains in the living room, trying to raise Navison on the radio, never hearing more than white noise. Karen, however, begins to deal with the consequences of Navison's disappearance. She starts paying more attention to her children. In a brief clip, we catch Karen on the phone, presumably with her mother, discussing their imminent departure from Virginia. It's no more than ten feet deep, and Navy's been gone for over four days. There's still a chance. Tom returns to the study to try and sleep. Karen remains in the living room, often trying to reach Navison on the radio. Navy. Are you there? Are you there? There is something odd about the stillness that settles on the room, not even remotely affected by rest and snoring on the couch. In the 5.09 a.m. high eight clip, Karen rests her head on her arms and begins to sleep. Out of the blue, Navison limps out of the hallway. He is exhausted, dehydrated. He kneels by Karen, attempting to waken her with the gentlest words. Navy? God damn it! Karen refuses to allow Navison's appearance to alter her plans. Her mind is made up. Even before he can recount his desperate flight up those stairs or how he found Holloway's equipment, Karen announces her intention of leaving for New York that night. Of course, by the time they had all sat down and watched the Holloway tape, Navison was the only one who had second thoughts about abandoning the cold lure of those halls. The opening of this sequence displays a card with the quote, The dreamer in his corner wrote off the world in a detailed daydream that destroyed one by one all the objects in the world. I'm lost, out of food, low on water, no sense of direction. Oh, God. I deserve this. I brought all this on me. But I'm sorry. But what does that matter? I shot them. I shot both of them. Half a canteen of water's all I got left. 
shouldn't have let them get away. Then I could have returned, told everyone they got lost. Lost. I'm Holloway Roberts, born in Menominee, Wisconsin. Bachelors from UMass. Explorer. Professional hunter. This is not right. It's not fair. I, d I don't deserve to die. I'm not alone. There's something here. I'm sure of it now. It's following me. No. It's stalking me. But it won't strike. It's just out there waiting. I don't know what for. It's near now. Waiting for me. Waiting for something. I don't know why it doesn't just make a play at... Oh, God! <laughs> Holloway Roberts! Menominee, Wisconsin! Oh, God! I don't want to die! This is not the place. <laughs> Unlike Navison, Karen does not need to watch the tape twice. She immediately starts dragging suitcases and boxes out into the rain. Reston helps. Go to a motel if you want. I've still got to pack up all the video and film. At first, Karen insists on remaining outside, but eventually the lure of lights and the murmur of familiar voices proves too much. Inside, she discovers Tom has attempted to provide some measure of security. Not only has he bolted four locks to the hallway door, he has gleefully established a barricade out of bureau, china cabinet, crowning his work with the bassinet from the foyer. Karen is touched by the way he comically clicks his heels and presents her with the four keys to the hallway. Only when she has disappeared upstairs does he lift up the bassinet and pull out a bottle of bourbon. Knock it off. Now is not the time to go on a binge. I am not drunk. Tom, you're lying on the floor. You know what Dean Martin said? Yes, you're not drunk if you can lie down without holding on. Well, look. No hands! <laughs> Come on. Coffee. You know, you've always got the floor. We're your best friend, you know why? Yeah, it's always there for you. That's right. Just like you, Navy. Navison's dehydrated. Hasn't eaten for two days. Now he's dragging supplies out of the car in the middle of a thunderstorm. Every step he takes hurts. He's dead on his feet, in total survival mode. And all it takes is her voice. Karen is upstairs when the bedroom begins to collapse. We watch the ceiling change from white to ash black and drop. He drops everything, just tears through the house to get to her. I was in the living room. Listen. Behind the door! Navy said it felt like it was running into the jaws of some big beast about to chomp down. <sighs> Sorry. Still gets me. Navy finds Karen hyperventilating on the floor. He scoops her up. Then that growl starts again, rolling in like bad thunder. He kept going down the stairs and finally outside. I was trying to get the hell out of there. The hallway door was bolted shut, but... I knew all hell was about to break loose. My first thought was it was Holloway. But that hammering was awful loud. I mean, the whole wall shuddered with every hit. Now, I'm thinking if that is Holloway, then he's changed. And I don't need to reacquaint myself 
with this new and improved version. Then it stops. Silence. No banging, no growl, nothing. I don't know how to describe it, but that silence was more powerful than any sound, any call. I had to answer it. That silence, I mean. I had to respond. I had to look. So I turn around, and you can see some of this on the video. The china cabinet and the bureau started to sink. My chair begins to slide. At first, I don't understand what's happening. Then it dawns on me that it's the floor that's dropping. My chair slipped out from under me and rolled down that slope. The floor must have sunk six, seven feet like the foundations had given away. Except there was no foundation. All there was... was blackness. If Navy didn't get to me fast, I was going to fall. All of it. The china cabinet, bureau, coffee tables, chairs just slid down that floor and vanished over the edge. Navy would have vanished too if he hadn't got hold of that dog. The floor was steeper than the Lotsey face, dropping right off into that familiar chill. I did the only thing I could think of. I swung on the door, which closed the gap to a few feet from where Billy was hanging. I made my jump. The next thing I knew, we were both out on the front lawn, getting soaked by the rain. Due to the absence of any exterior cameras, all experiences outside the house rely on personal accounts. Inside, however, the wall-mounted hiates continue to function. Outside, rain overwhelms everything. Reston sits on the grass, soaked to the bone. Karen is still unconscious, lying in the car, exactly where Nabison put her. Nabison is trying to decide how he should re-enter the house, when the sound of shattering glass draws into the backyard. It was the kitchen window breaking. And when Navy heard it, he just took off, running. The whole place keeps shuddering, walls cracking only to melt back together again, floors fragmenting and buckling. The black ash below spreads like printer's ink over everything, transforming each corner, closet and corridor into that awful dark. In the kitchen, Tom and Daisy's breath begins to frost. Tom throws a stool through the window. Okay, Daisy girl, make it through here and you're home free. Tom, here. Tom. Cradling Daisy, Tom starts running as fast as he can, trying to outrace the void yawning up behind them. Tom holds Daisy out to Nabison, who, despite the glass scratching bloody lines along his forearms, rips her free of the house and into safety. Tom, however, has found his limit. Navison begins to climb through the window. The walls snap shut and shatter all the fingers in Tom's outstretched hands. Blood covers his arms and pours from his nose and ears. God damn it, Tom! Ah! Run! Ah! Hang on! I'm coming again! Oh, Christ! What? In less time than it takes for a single frame of film to flash upon a screen, the floor dissolves, turning the kitchen into a vertical shaft. Tom tumbles into blackness, not even a scream flung up behind him to mark his fall. Navison's twin, stolen and finally mocked in silence, not even the sound of Tom hitting the bottom. That awful gasp was heard by Billy Reston, perhaps by Karen, who suddenly groaned, and by her son Chad, who crouched among the trees, listening and finally watching the sobs of his father and little sister, until something dark and unknown told him to find his mother. After escaping the house, Navison and Karen and their children lived apart. Some months later, after writing a drunken and heartfelt love letter to his wife, Navison returns to the house, where he finds everything perfectly normal, though the hallway is still there. It's four locks in place. As was always his intention, he enters the labyrinth of the hall and vanishes. A month after that, 
Karen returns to the house, looking for her husband. The Navison record now stands as part of this country's cultural experience, and yet in spite of the fact that hundreds of thousands of people have seen it, the film continues to remain an enigma. Some insist it must be true. Others believe it is a trick on a par with the Orson Welles radio romp, The War of the Worlds. Many more have never even heard of it. The cats have been dying, and everyone wonders why. I can hear my neighbors murmur. They murmur all the time. It's strange. Some cats die. Some just disappear. No one knows why. Redwood. I saw him once a long time ago, when I was young. I ran away, and luckily, or no luck at all, he did not follow me. But now I cannot run. And anyway, this time, I am certain he would follow. <laughs> Recordings recovered from the House of Leaves was adapted by Mike Walker from the novel by Mark Z. Danielewski. The narrator was Jim Norton, and it starred William Hope as Navidson, Deborah Weston as Karen, and Martin McDougall as Tom Navidson. Jed Leader was played by Jeff Mash, Holloway by Richard Ridings, Reston by Vinter Morgan, and Daisy by Eleanor Blaney. The producer and director was John Taylor, and it was a fiction factory production for BBC Radio 4.